morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this, uh, this fine day. I'm uh, Vernon Irvin. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Revenue Officer for Everbridge, which is a global software company specializing in generating enterprise-level resiliency software, helping organizations respond faster, quicker, more efficiently, saving people's lives and organizations around the world. Today, millions and millions of uh, the world's citizens rely on Everbridge to notify them when there are dangerous situations going on in the world. That could be cyber, that could be, unfortunately, world climate uh, changes in the, in, the, in, the, in the world. This morning, we're going to have a couple of very excited uh, colleagues from Everbridge. We're going to spend some time talking about how our software helps companies and countries become more resilient, respond faster uh, to, unfortunately, climate change. And so you're going to hear from Jessica Deckinger, who's our Senior Vice President and Chief Communications Officer, as well as our Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Dr. John Mita. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to our, our guest. Over to you, Jessica. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. All right. Let's do this. We've been planning, preparing. How do you feel, Jessica? I feel good, good and I want this good? to be fun. So if, if we're, we need to pause and answer questions, please interrupt us. All right. And this is supposed to be interactive. So at any point you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. It's all right. This is World Climate Moment. <laughs> it's urgent. Okay, so first of all, how can technology help address climate resilience? I think we saw it in the Howden panel earlier about the idea that parametric insurance can change things. What does that mean? It means having intelligence, having information about what to do. It used to be that intelligence took like Time. There was a thing called mail before. Remember mail? You'd stick in a piece of paper and go on a boat, whatever kind of thing. And that information travels really fast. Um, also, the fact that both public and private have become digitally transformed. So everyone is in this game now, which is a good thing. And if we know anything about the Earth right now, it has always been a complex system. Imagine how we're traveling at 10,000 kilometers per hour right now around the sun. That sounds kind of dangerous, doesn't it? So it's always been a fragile system that we just live in and take for granted. Imagine all this data pulled together and what you get. You get massive amounts of data. And as we know, massive amounts of data are things that AI and all systems love to eat up and sometimes produce useful predictions of what may happen. Now, when you think about this word resilience, it is quite popular. Uh, if anything, if you look at Google Trends, it's been rising year over year. There was this spike that many people say, COVID, not really. Uh, a lot of different things have come together that have sort of come into that sort of perfect storm of resilience becoming the key word today for the future. And I think that the theme of COP, the theme of even these workshops, has been on resilience. But it's kind of hard to understand resilience. So we at Everbridge decided to make it easy for you because technology can be quite complex, but good organizations help to make it simpler. So we've been assessing organizations, global organizations, companies, and in the United States agencies for their ability to be resilient. And what we discovered is something simple. This is a little, a little secret we're gonna share with you now. This is like brand new, it's just out of the labs. The first thing is that if you think about the stack here of how people respond to things, emergency responders take care of the disaster. And then above here, you have all the people who are more important, per se, the employees, the leaders, managers, and of course, the president, PM, et cetera. You have a stack of people who are responsible for resilience. But the people that take on the fire the most are the emergency responders. And when you think about it, they're there to protect. They're committed to protect. If you're an emergency responder, they want to save lives. But also, there is this idea of restore. We heard the word adapt in the last panel. There's someone who's in charge of adaptation. It's not the emergency responder. It's everyone above that authority stack. And lastly, though, we have to remember, the whole point of being resilient isn't just to be resilient. It's to prosper. It's to succeed. 
The goal is to actually do better. And that's where resilience has this outcome of prosper. And once you are able to sort of prosper, you can reinvest that prosperity into more resilience. That's how you become adaptive. This is the Everbridge Resilience Life Cycle. I'm proud to show it to you today. And it's built upon our Best Enterprise Resilience Program. Now, it turns out that I get to work with Jessica Deckinger, the Chief Communication Officer, who, like at the White House, is the kind of the person always there at the front <laughs> explaining everything we're doing at Everbridge. So, Jessica, tell me and tell all of us, how does unlocking resilience to risk climate? Well, I think the interesting thing, actually, and John brings up a good point, which is that information is very powerful, right, in building this resilience over time. But the big thing is that there are actually also immediate implications to not just having the information, but communicating it out effectively, which sounds very simple, but for anyone who's worked in a uh, private or public organization, they know that the communication oftentimes is the most broken and confusing. If you do communicate effectively, we believe that through Everbridge technology and technologies like it and public warning, you actually can avoid replacement costs. Think about it, right? A storm hits, a flood hits, a fire hits. You tell your population very rapidly that this is coming because you have the data, but communicating it effectively allows them to move their cars, protect their homes, protect their goods. The zero replacement cost of that has meaningful impact because of the escalation of climate events right now. So you're losing, we're losing all the time, cars and homes and personal goods. And if people can actually move those out of the path of destruction, there's ultimately the impact that we can change the way that we reproduce those goods and, and reduce carbon impact. The second is just the adaptation part, which to John's point, right, we're all humans, we just wanna know what's going on. And if the information stays locked up with those who are trying to rescue us, we can't actually adapt and rescue ourselves. Leaders can't adapt and, inf and, and provide that influential information that will help people to shape the way that they themselves operate as organizations, as individuals in the community. And the third part is really loss and damage. Think about it, organized response. If you can tell your, your flood management team in advance of the, the disaster that's about to happen, let's prepare everybody, let's put up dams and sandbags and all those things and you organize more effectively, which we all know is a challenge. Public and private sector organization is always a challenge. You have the potential to make meaningful impact. That's what we're really excited about is the opportunity for public-private collaboration through public warning to make that impact. Mm. That makes sense. Mitigate, adapt, loss and damage. Okay, uh, let's learn some more. So, how does unlocking resilience empower the public, Jessica? Well, I think this is the, this is the challenging part, which is that it's very easy to sit back on the, the tools that we have and resources, the information we have, the HydroMet services, and not be able to communicate. And this is where we come in, which is actually at the bottom of the cyclical process, which is the, be able, the ability to just digest the information that we have to effectively share it out, to be the last mile of communications to the resources and the people that are needed to create that cyclical resilience. And to John's point, to be fiscally productive so that you actually can rebound faster, rebound stronger, um, and build a stronger future and attack all the things that we're trying to accomplish here um, and beyond. So the goal is to prosper, but how do you get to the goal? You have to find a way to respond. Hmm, right. Good. All right. Uh, and so we have six global lessons by being the number one global provider of nationwide public alerting solutions. And they're all kind of not obvious if you don't know how this happens. And I think the most important thing to note is this multiple channel thing. Now you might think an alert comes on your phone, right? I'll send you an SMS message and I'm done. Turns out that you may still have a fax machine and you may not have digitally transformed. I know, it's true, that you, as we know, they're out there. <laughs> you may not actually turn on your mobile phone all the time with Instagram and you like walk by things. You need signs telling you something. You may not be as connected as we all think in the digitally advanced nations. And so Everbridge's systems, our technology, covers every possible edge case of technology, which in many cases you might have think, isn't that gone now? The reality is when you are notifying people, you are responsible for every mode of communication. The other thing that's so beautiful is we also target inclusively. Let's break that down. Nobody wants to be tracked all day long, correct? We're in Europe, right? Who wants to be tracked all day long? Uh, yeah, right? right? Uh, so, why is this targeted thing important? Because if you spray an entire country, 
but you're traveling and we think you're still there, you're like, whoa, I'm not there. I'm actually in somewhere else. And so we have to kind of know where you are and we can do that in a privacy preserving way. How? It turns out that the mobile carriers, we entrust a lot of data with them and you have a SIM attached to it and your SIM has a nationality to it. Even that bit of anonymity is able to be preserved. So we do everything we can to preserve that privacy, but also not confuse you with a message that doesn't apply to you. So it's that kind of custom tailored way of notifying that Everbridge is so famous for. Now, it turns out that you may know about us because we are number one in this space. And Jessica has some incredible stories to share. Jessica. What we the want Netherlands. To, I think this is great. And John makes a good point. <laughs> That's how it works, right? I know. Just pat, passing with the, you know, the, the, our emotions. All was great. Um, no, but we wanted to make this tangible. We are in existence. We are in operation. And we're making impact now. And we wanted to share with you a couple of use cases to make it real. I feel like one of the wonderful things, but also challenging things about conferences like this is sometimes they become very theoretical very fast. And it's wonderful when you can make it real. Well, we are, we've been in... Um, with our public warning system in the Netherlands since 2012, alerting on a variety of different use cases, the, the residents there. We reach 94% of the people there, whether they're traveling and visiting there or they live there full time um, with these alert messages. And one, an example of that is here, where we're telling people essentially that, that people need to get to safety, right? And it's really meaningful impact. What we hear is that people love this system. They enjoy getting the alerts and they use them to save themselves and the things they care about. They use them to save public resources. Um, and, and one of the great things is that it, it is really uh, on the, the volume of what we do, unfortunately, is needed more now than ever. The volume of alerts that are needed before even COVID, we had 173 alerts in the Netherlands in, in 2019, that's pre-COVID. But knowing that, it gives us real visibility into knowing that the, these op op opportunities to communicate are on the rise. We have the opportunity to really then take advantage of those to bring people to safety, to create resilience, and to get that positive outcome that people want. Now, you may find it a little bit annoying when you get, ah, there's a storm coming your way if it's not impacting you. But for those who are in need, it's a really, really, really meaningful experience. And so that's exciting for us. So we wanted to share one other um, use case study with you, which we thought was, was interesting. If you could flip the slide. So New Zealand, again, since 2017, we reached 90% of the population. We asked them, is it effective? Is it not effective? The top two boxes, four and five here, between those two, yeah, so there you go. 80% of the population is excited about the fact they're getting these messages. Amazing. <laughs> People actually like the technology, which actually is interesting. It's, a, it's an experience I've had over time that folks who actually enjoy a technology will engage with it more. So the fact that 80% of the population is enjoying receiving the messages means they will actually find them useful and will watch them and then take action, which is the big thing. Can you make impact? We have evidence to show that we can make impact, which is exciting times. And then for developing nations, you know, John made the allusion to the fax machine. We, we joke, but in a developing nation where challenges and, and economic resources may not be as easily available in this moment, we build that resilience and allow them to reinvest in building the, the technology that does allow them to move towards a more modern form of communication. But in the meantime, we reach them everywhere. Radio, social media, um, sirens, right? The things that you need to do to reach a population, we have those capabilities. And so it means that we're opening the door to create an even playing field for developing nations. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that because not many technologies do that. Many are very much serving of the top, top, most financially you know, stable economies, and this is allowing folks to, to get on an even playing field across the globe. So we really love that, because from an inclusivity perspective, we need that, we need that globalness. We have that perspective here at this conference, but it needs to extend beyond. And we feel great as being a part of a company that's mission-driven, that is able to provide that opportunity for everybody to play in the same, in the same field, so. So now we have a little video, actually. We wanted to make it interesting. Don't listen to us just talk the whole time. It's kind of boring. I uh, wanted to make sure you had a little video just to understand a little more about public warning. It's very short. There we go. The magic of technology. <laughs>
video experience. Okay. It's very emotional. Now, when you think about it, that video we just saw, a lot of it was about calamities, perils. Nobody likes calamities or perils. We look away from it, and it takes up a lot of our cognitive load. But remember, we go through those experiences to prosper. I want to keep re reiterating this. The goal isn't to sort of address the bad, it's to be in the good. Because being in the good is what makes living meaningful. So, um, now when you think about unlocking resilience and the examples that my colleague Jessica just went through, the Netherlands came up. So who has been to Amsterdam before? Raise your hand. Okay, so it is a beautiful place. Um, it has some interesting things there, as we know. Um, but the Netherlands are special because that word means lower lands because it is 50% below sea level. So it is the most resilient country in the world by definition. That is why that system of waterways exists. And to think that of all the companies they chose to be able to notify folks was Everbridge. Now, I've been Everbridge for like a year now, and I was blown away when I heard that because people don't go to the Netherlands to experience emergency alerts they go to experience incredible environment. And it is that combination of the yin and yang, essentially, that I think we're all in right now. Resilience is for the good part. Now, when you think about how these things link together, of government alignment and public safety, Jessica, take it away. Well, I think this is the big thing, which is that effective public spending actually matters, right? And it's something we all critique probably in our own home governments that we feel like the spending that they're that they're making sometimes is not necessarily the most effective or efficient or has the most return for us in terms of our existence as both citizens and constituents of that country. One of the great things is that um, the benefit of having this kind of resilience in place is that it actually helps the government not just save money but be more fiscally responsible to their citizens, which is a great opportunity to unlock something like that with technology. Typically technology feels like it's heavy spend less ROI. This is big return on investment for governments, which is fantastic. And so again, just to, just to bring it, make it real, right? It's not just a slide with arrows on it. So we ask people, we ask our customers, what do you want? And they say, we want to help our citizens save their dog, right? A storm comes, if they hear about it too late, you see this on the news all the time. If, a, if there's a flood and you see the dogs kind of like left behind, the pets left behind, right? It's really a personal thing. This is duty of care, caring for our citizens, caring for our employees, caring for the people who do things for us, who, who are working very hard to be a part of it, a, you know, kind of a productive society, they need to have, know that their government, that their um, business, that where they work is invested in them as individuals, and that's part of the story. And the equal and inclu inclusive part is also a big deal we talked about before, that you can reach everybody inclusive, regardless of their technological advancement or where they are. And then the prevention of loss and damage. Again, we want to save the resources so we're not reproducing cars in mass every time a storm hits, right? It's a big deal and a growing problem, and we want to make sure we're, we're getting ahead of that. So John, I wanted to pass it to you, I think, for the next. Or Becky, me, I should say. Before we go there, we have a picture of a pet here, Jessica, pet. I know, it's a dog. It's a dog, he's very cute, there's two, yeah. Because the pet, it, it turns out that when you talk to emergency managers, they say the number one thing that folks are concerned about is their, their pets. Dog. yeah, their pets. <laughs> exactly, so you have to remember that pets can't get text messages, right? So the, it, it's us humans that are receiving these messages that remind you take care of your pet, because when you're in a danger, you forget. And so the communication content is also an art, this space. Okay. I'm John, pass it to you, there you go. So when you think about this concept that Jessica laid out, total resilience, again, remember the resilience life cycle the, to protect, restore, and prosper, it's not an easy thing. So everyone who uses the word resilience, it's pretty hard. But with resilience life cycle, and how that works. But total resilience, how to get there. As an organization, Everbridge, we spent a lot of effort, 20 years, creating a more protective resilience through messaging technologies. And we're in a new chapter thinking about how to get proactive technologies, use AIML to be able to enable more organizations to not know after the fact, but at that moment and before. And that's gonna make them much more resilient. But the work that Jessica described around the inclusion aspect, 
you know, not just the most wealthy, but everyone having a chance to be resilient. On the personal side, I think of anything, this idea of personal resilience has come to the foreground in the pandemic because of all, what the thing that we have learned is that everyone experiences suffering differently. There's different levels of privilege that enable you to go through it easier than someone who has less. And so when we think about personal resilience at Everbridge, uh, we're both passionate about being at Everbridge, um, it's the fact that organizations, companies, are now having to understand how to focus on their culture and to care about every individual as a person. If you think about it, corporations did not have to do that as much until COVID landed at this scale. And now I will care about you as a person because I like to retain you. It's hard to hire. So there's also a practical aspect too. So um, when Jessica first raised this idea of personal resilience, it reminded me of how I was in New York visiting um, a fragrance company. You know fragrance? They have these people called noses. They are like special people who can like, they're really good smells. Not anything. They're smells. And so I met the designer of Kenzo's original perf no, Kenzo perfume. So, and he's like 87 years old. But wow, super spry fellow. Um, but anyways, um, I learned about smell. Um, and uh, he sat me down at a table and blindfolded me. This is not going to get weird, but um, he had me smell <laughs> things. <laughs> smell, smell. And then he took off the blindfold and had some watercolor paint and said, paint the colors that you saw. And so I paint the colors. And then he pulled a card out behind my head and said, it's these colors, right? And I was like, whoa, magic trick. The second one, the third one, etc. But Anyways, I'm not telling you about the smell thing. I'll tell the story about how this person, the legendary nose, was hired by my friend, the CEO of the fragrance company. He said, you know, people think I'm, I'm strange. He's like 87 years old. Because if you go to his office, he has teddy bears, little teddy bears, hundreds of teddy bears, not just like 10 or 20 in an office. We're talking you walk in and it's like bear heaven. And it's a bit odd, you know? And he carries a bear everywhere he goes. And he has a little chair for this bear. And he said, you know, uh, when I was uh, at uh, an unnamed fragrance company, uh, my, my wife died. And when she died, I wanted to remember her. So this one bear she loved, I would carry this bear to work every day, get in the subway, carry it, put it on the desk, work, bring it back. And so for like five years, he did this. And it turns out that people at work thought this was weird. Uh, to the point of his former boss, uh, when uh, he brought the bear to, to a meeting, the boss said, don't bring that bear here. That's not okay. It turns out that the customer came in and said, where's your bear? And he said, my boss says I can't have the bear here. And the customer just got up and said, well, I'm leaving until he lets you bring the bear back. But it was an example of how certain customers, certain companies recognize the individual. Fast forward to 30 years later, He's like 85 years old, he's retired. And this person wanted to recruit him. So set up time to meet at a coffee shop in Brooklyn. And then he shows up, and then the CEO says to the, the nose, where's your bear? And he said, my bear? My bear's over here. And he said, well, set the bear next to you because we're having a business meeting. And then, he puts a the bear there, and by the end of the thing, he said, you know what, I want you to work for me, and um, I have a contract written for you, and also a contract for the bear. <laughs> and immediately, he said, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but his example of people's resilience, the personality of every individual matters, and that ability to customize the communication is a very human task. And that's where we excel as a company, because of this mission that we all share. I agree, and I think that the thing that's really interesting when it comes back to what we talked about earlier about this is that ultimately, as much as we're all in the same room here fighting for the same cause, we need to mobilize the communities around us to do the same. And the way to do that is by duty of care and explaining to them that we care in meaningful ways and demonstrating in meaningful ways that that's actually the reality we do care. So um, we're gonna do a millennial thing now. We're Go gonna ahead. be super, super fun, I think, I hope. Let's see if we can make it work. Does everybody have a cell phone? Thumbs up, yes, cell phones? Okay, pull out your cell phone. Uh, open a browser. 
And we want you to type in at the top menti.com. And it should land you on a page that asks for a code. We'll give you a second to do that. Thumbs up if you get it. You get the code, okay, the code is right six, six, seven, four, five. It's like really long, just to make it complicated. To display? <laughs> it's a test, this is a test, just come on okay. test. Okay, nine, zero, five, six, six, seven, four, five, hit the heart, hit the heart button. We'll know you showed up. Oh, cool. There we go, hit the heart button, okay, good, thank you. Go ahead, six, nine, zero, five, six, six, seven, four, five. Can you switch to the display, please? Okay, if anyone so didn't get four the code. people have arrived. Very good. Four people hit the heart. Good. Okay. All right. So let's. What do you fancy most about Scotland? It's not a trick question. Not a trick question. There's no right answer. If you've been able to get out. <laughs> okay. All right. Raquel, what appear here? Do I hit the next thing? Uh, you should hit the next thing. Okay. You have Nope. Oh, this way. Which country are you from, living in? I think this is not displaying That's not the displaying the right thing, is it? But people yeah. are answering. Yeah. Wait, let's go back if we can do it. People are answering. Okay, so wait. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't appear. Let's see if we can display the results. Wait, Raquel, can you display the results there? I will try. Because, John, don't click forward. Wait. Yeah, there Yay, we go. There Ooh, we go. whiskey. Good call. Good whiskey. choice. <laughs> all right. That's probably because we've all been out at night after a long day of listening to people talk, so that's good. People are into bagpipes. We support that. We really support that. I'm into bagpipes. Um, well, some of us heard bagpipes. We some familiar faces last night, which was a gift. So if you haven't heard a bagpipe, please oh. try to find a place that has bagpipes. Can you show the results for this one? Which country are you from living in? Do you have some magical thing? Oh, look at that. Wow, look at that. Wow, look at that. Columbia, you're saying. Oh, wow, that's really So cool. we really are global. I love it. Super Fantastic. Numbers, Welcome. Many types of thinkers. Okay, okay, last one. I know there's a few more. Wait. What is the biggest weather related extreme event you are most worried about? This Whoa. is actually helpful for us to know. It depends upon where you're from, so this is a giveaway <laughs> here. Who's going to win, Jessica? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. know. Could be a lot of. I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm from the Northeast, so in the U.S., mm -hmm. so I worry about nor'easters. We call them these massive storms. Right. Is quicksand weather? I don't think quicksand's weather. <laughs> That's just my random thing. All right. Okay. Fifty. Here we go. All right. Bring them up. Go ahead and show the results. It. Heat wave. Yeah, flooding. Floodings. Floodings top. Number number two. Heat wave. All right. Oh, don't worry about earthquakes too much because <laughs> earthquakes are really uh, uh, sporadic. I've been I've been studying the earth, so we're okay there. All right, <laughs> that was it. It's a lot. Do we have, let's say if we have, do we have one we have more? One more? <laughs> Whoa. Okay. What is preventing countries from having a public warning system to alert on extreme climate events? Regulation, infrastructure, information. This is now real time. Information, finance. Yeah. This is like a finance brain to groups. I figure everyone go like here, but no, no there maybe we go. not. Oh, John, sure. you're swaying oh, the results, okay. John. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Don't listen to John. That, that happens in elections election sometimes. <laughs> All right, we are on time, Jessica. We did it. Okay, we did it. So. Um, we wanted to thank you so much for engaging with us on this. I hope it was fun. We we love doing these kind of fun things. We wanted to give you guys some time just to to chat and have an open discussion. Um, and so some of these questions, I guess, it would be great to hear some kind of from you all, what you think, why you think these things are the way they are and how we can change them, because you're obviously all coming from different perspectives. Does anyone have any questions for us or want to answer this one? Go ahead. Oh, there we go. Yeah, uh, I'm Julian Richardson from Applied Healing. I'd love to know what your uh, expert view or answer to that question would Yeah, it seems to be that from our perspective, information actually is a challenge. Like even just people knowing what we're sharing today, even here, it's been interesting for me that I think there's so much information flowing around about what should be done and so many problems that we're trying to solve at the same time. It feels as if it's hard to sift through and that's what we're trying to do is be, help be the purveyors of this information in a way that's effective and can break through all the noise that governments are facing and that organizations are facing. But it does remain a challenge because there's so much people, the, world, the word digital transformation, we talk about this a lot, means a lot of things. Also means almost nothing, right? We, no one knows exactly what it means. It's kind of squidgy and it's referred to with all sorts of different mediums. And so how we fit into the digital transformation opportunity is a, a message that I just joined the company a year ago with John. We joined right about the same time. 
we're trying to get that information out effectively and we can't do it by alerting people on their cell phones, but we certainly can do it by attending events like this and meeting with folks who are influential in their own local governments and organizations. And that's what we're really trying to do is to be out there sharing this information and empowering people to make decisions. Because the regulation, the requirements, there's an EU mandate now for folks, for governments to install public warning systems, but I'm sure that the folks on the other end are reeling with all the information about how that's supposed to happen, right? So we're, we're trying to crystallize that and hopefully you can all become part of that message. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then Dom, do you want to? Regulation. Well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the, it's, it's all the effects. answer is for the, for the, you know, the developing countries, it's finance. And, and actually, you know, there is a level, a level of information around you know, why we're talking about I mean, you, a, a well-run public alerting system you know, for every dollar you spend on a public alerting system, can save you. It's difficult to predict, but over a hundred dollars in, you know, damage prevention uh, just by getting people out, let alone loss of life. So, you know, there's real economic. Dom, can you come up? Can you come over here? Because we can people hear you. Yeah. Come up. It's kind of all the above, which here. is a good thing. So, yeah, yeah. Come, come, come up. No. Come sit over here. These are members Stop. of the Everbridge team. Stop. We are lucky to have our team. Sit down. No, no. All right. Well. Here. Oh, um, my name is Dominic Jones, by the way. Nice to meet you. I um, run business development. For Dom everybody. knows everything. I don't <laughs> actually know everything, but, but I do know a little bit about this. So, you know, I think what, what's fascinating, what's present, preventing countries from uh, investing in this technology, in, and particularly in developing countries, is really what we've talked about today. So it's the finance. It's the ability to be able to fund these systems. And actually, when you... Uh, you know, we talked about Somalia today, they don't even have a healthcare system. Why would you have a public alerting system, uh, you know, in, in, instead? Well, th these aren't particularly expensive systems, but, you know, for every you know, dollar that you spend on being able to alert people to be able to get uh, out of the way of these events, you're saving, you know, thousands of dollars in, in, uh, in, in cost of life, in ultimately the cost, cost of, yeah. Yeah, the cost of it. And really, you know, talking, with our Howden friends here as well, you know, just to reinforce the fact that if we're able to have a public warning system in place, not only can we then make use of these parametric insurance policies that you know David and Charlie have, have been have been building and actually move capital from what is effectively the recovery phase into the emergency response phase, which ultimately, you know, when applied, will give us a far better and more effective response. Um, you know, these systems are the mechanism to be able to manage and coordinate an effective emergency response. And so, you know, when you look at systems that we have deployed, particularly in India uh, and other parts of the world, you know, they're typically against certain threats, whether they are tsunami, uh, particularly for coastal regions of India, um, whether they are for, um, you know, actually, believe it or not, Norway's original, uh, the reason that Norway originally deployed our system is because they're afraid that the uh, glacier in the field is going to collapse at some point. Maybe right. They were very. They built it about ten years ago, which ultimately will cause a type cause a tidal wave and uh, take out Oslo. You know, I mean, these are these are real events that, that that people are worried about. It varies dependent on where you are in the world and what the and regionally uh, what you need. You know how you, how you need to think about it. That, by the way, is the reason why, again, you know, a good insurance partnership, I keep coming back to the conversation that we had earlier, and insuring against those, you know, catastrophic perils fits very, very neatly with what we're doing here. Um, I think that's right. And it could be all of the above in some ways, right? Because all these things, yeah, it, you guys were right. You were well, right as well. You know, the crazy thing is that certainly for developing countries, the mobile network is by far the most mature piece of infrastructure. And so this technology works really, really well. I mean, it's actually, believe it or not, easier to deploy in some of those mobile-first environments than it is in, in, in some of the more legacy environments. But yeah. Val, you wanted to add? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, if I can see. Okay. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, is what I'd say. Each of those answers are correct, but it depends which geography you're working in. So in India, finance can be an issue, but the state of West Bengal have had World Bank funding for four years, and they still haven't been able to procure a system because of the information flow across the multiple layers of stakeholders hasn't been optimised. If we look at Africa, 
funding is the number one there because the infrastructure that they need to build to enable this plus to get to the rural and the urban communities really matters so they have to really think about working with the banks the multilaterals insurance and finance to get that stuff in place latin america is very regulation orientated they just can't seem to come together as countries to actually get it through so we work in peru and we work in ecuador but that sort of the big issue in that in that space and um infrastructure if you think about pacific islands we're trying to put sirens in they haven't got power you have to think about solar phones solar power those those countries have a different set of, of issues that they have to deal with so we work with uh, engage with 151 countries in the world trying to navigate through all of these issues to help them join the dots across these issues to get to get the right solution in so um, in india as don was saying three states 140 million people protected from random things that you wouldn't expect in bihar for example 400 people last year killed by being hit by lightning i mean you don't you don't think about those things the the community should go and hide under trees it's the worst thing they can do so actually trying to get that communication to them is really the challenge so for me it's a mix of all of the above but the important thing is joining the dots across government, corporate, the citizens, finding the money because it always is an issue. But it's not the only issue, and it's quite surprising the things that become barriers. So, we have a question over here as well. Would you like to? Yeah, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was going to ask if um, in uh, Europe, uh, do you think that the um, privacy regulation or GDPR is a barrier for the streaming of uh, your system or, or not? Well, uh, Go ahead, yeah. well no, uh, no. Um, no, it's no, it's not. <laughs> uh, because, largely because of the controls we have in place. Um, you know, there are two types of system. There are, there, there are advanced systems which use uh, a location-based capability to judge actually um, the population density within the uh, area of cell towers. And the only data that's really pulled from that is the SIM prefix. So, you know, I have, I have a US SIM card, and mine's so mine's plus one. You know, most of you guys will be plus four, four. Uh, you know, there'll be a few, of, I'm sure yours is I, wherever you're from. Um, that data is important that we pull that because it allows us to be able to deliver the message in the language that someone would understand, right? So you don't want to be delivering uh, you know, a message to a Chinese tourist necessarily in, in, in English, it might not work. And, and certainly, uh, you know, Iceland is a user of that system as an example. The other, the other uh, more uh, generic system is what uses a cell broadcast technology. So that's when you, know, you don't get the SMS alert, you actually, your phone just lights up and, and, and that is a, is a broadcast and therefore, you know, there is no pri private data, uh, you know, uh, in, in that at all, other than the fact that you are a cell phone within the uh, uh, vicinity of that cell tower, and therefore you you know you you would uh, you would receive that message. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much. We're so grateful that you're here. We'll hang around for a while just to answer any other questions or chat with folks and. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much to everybody here for hosting us. We, we appreciate it.